I am so excited about this lecture because this is a lecture where I get to show you the 10 steps in action. Specifically, I am going to use my 10 step method along with the guide to create a room design from start to finish. So let's get to it. Here is the room that I'll be creating a design for. As you can see, it's a living room and it's also empty which means that I won't be incorporating any current furniture pieces or other furnishings like I often do for clients, and you may be doing as well. That said, as you know, step one is measure your room. I've gone ahead and created the floor plan. I could have certainly drawn it by hand, but I chose to use a software program instead. You can see I've included the windows here, and there's a large cased opening here to the room, which is just another way of saying a doorway with trim, but no door. Step two is decide on key activities. As this is a living room, this is going to be a place for entertaining and relaxing. I love to read, so I'll choose that activity specifically. Step three is choose your style. With this beautiful wood flooring as inspiration, I've decided that I'm going to go with mid-century modern as my primary style and contemporary as my secondary style. Moving on to step four, choose your color scheme, I'm going to draw from the existing architecture and will be using white and beige as my neutrals and blue and green will be my accent colors. I'll be using walnut for my wood finish because nothing says mid-century modern like walnut does. And for my metal finishes, I'll be using a combination of brass and chrome. Choosing our rug is the next step. As you can see, this is a large room and can easily accommodate a 9 by 12 or 274 by 366 centimeter rug. So that is what I'll be looking for. Based on my color scheme, I'm going to select a rug that incorporates the accent colors from my color scheme. And for the material, I've decided that I'd like a wool rug. I've just completed my online searching and I found this rug. Because my secondary style is contemporary, I decided to go with a contemporary abstract rug and I think it's going to work really well in my design. Moving on to step six, choose your furniture. I've decided on the following pieces based on the key activities for this room. A sofa, two accent chairs, a coffee table, an end table, two bookcases to store all of my books, a backless bench, and a console table. Now that I've drawn in my pieces, I made sure to confirm that I have appropriate clearance for all of these items, specifically, that I have a minimum of 36 inches or 91 centimeters for the main passageways through the room, 22 inches or 56 centimeters for space between furniture pieces so one can pass comfortably, and between 14 and 18 inches or 36 and 46 centimeters between my seating and coffee table. I also made sure that the coffee table is roughly two thirds the length of my sofa. Now that I've drawn in my furniture, I'm also going to check to ensure that I have the right size rug and I do because all of the pieces of my seating arrangement sit perfectly on the rug and is not interfering with the bookcases or the console table. Again, because I'm starting from scratch, I'm going to need to source all of these pieces. I've spent some time doing that. Let me show you what I've found. From my secondary style contemporary, I've chosen the following pieces. This gorgeous leather sofa and this streamlined console table. All of my other furniture pieces, specifically the accent chairs, coffee table, end table, bookcases, and bench are in the style of mid-century modern, which of course is the primary style of my room. Now let me go ahead and put all of these pieces into the mood board so we can see what it looks like together. This is looking great. You can see that the accent chairs and bench pick up the colors that are in my rug and I've repeated both circular and straight clean lines to create harmony in my design. I've also made sure to store all of the links to these pieces so I can go back to purchase them when I'm ready to do so. An important note, make sure to double check the sizes of the pieces that you selected. I double checked the sizes and ended up making a few minor adjustments to the lengths of the sofa, coffee table, and the console table. Fortunately, this didn't create any issues with spacing between pieces. Moving on to step seven, choose wall art and wall decor. Looking at my floor plan, I definitely want some artwork for the north wall, and I'd like something over the console table on the west wall. I don't need wall art or decor for the remaining two walls, as the east wall is nearly all windows, and the south wall has a large cased opening, 
and my plan is to place large indoor trees in those corners, which I'll get to in step nine, but I'm already thinking ahead. So for in between the two bookcases, I've selected the striking contemporary abstract artwork piece. It was important to me that I find a piece of artwork that had the same green that we see in the bench, given the close proximity of these two pieces. And this piece is perfect. For over the console table, I've chosen this beautiful round brass mirror. Now let's go ahead and put them in the mood board. This is really coming together. But next is my favorite part of the design. Step eight, choose your lighting. For ambient lighting, I want to use a large flush or semi-flush mount light. For task lighting, I'm going to use table lamps on the console table. And for accent lighting, I'm going to use LED strip lights in the bookcases, a picture light for the artwork, and I'll use some floor can up lights for the indoor trees I mentioned. I've gone contemporary all the way from my lighting and chosen the statement flush mount light, these beautiful table lamps, and this sleek picture light. You might have noticed that they all are in a chrome finish, and that is a great contrast with the brass in the room. Let's go ahead and put them in the mood board. Yes, perfect! I like that from this perspective, the light fixture does not obstruct the view at all of the eye-catching artwork. Okay, on to step nine, window coverings. Obviously, I only need to worry about window treatments for the east wall, since these are my only windows. Because my primary style is mid-century modern, I could leave these large windows bare, and that would be completely style appropriate. But as I mentioned in the step nine lecture, I always like a way to control the natural light and my privacy, so I'll be using simple white drapery panels. Finally, we've arrived at step 10. Choose your accessories and greenery. First, let's start with the console table. I'm going to add a trio of mid-mod candle holders and a small contemporary sculpture. Now I will go ahead and add books and a mixture of stylish accessories from both the mid-century modern and contemporary styles to the bookcases. But I'll leave the beautiful coffee table bare in a nod to the contemporary style. As I previously mentioned, I will be adding two tall indoor plants to these corners of the room. Here is the plant I'll be using. And I'll also add some matching succulent arrangements to the bookcases in the back. And there it is, a beautiful room design using my 10-step method. I hope you found this lecture helpful, but more importantly, I hope it makes you feel confident to try this method in your own home. Happy decorating. Now that you've learned how to design a room using the 10-step method, and you've seen me use it, in this section, I want to move on to some additional techniques and more advanced topics that you may find helpful with your own interior designs. Let's start by talking about focal points. There is no question that focal points are an important design element, and chances are you've already included one in your room during the 10-step process, whether you were aware of it or not. But first, what is a focal point? Put simply, it's a standout piece or element that draws your attention upon entering the room. It's the star of the show, if you will. In a bedroom, the bed is often the focal point. In a dining room, the dining room table or light fixture over the table is typically the focal point. In a living room, a fireplace usually plays that role. However, there are definitely other elements that can play this role as well, including a beautiful wall or ceiling treatment, even if it's just a vibrant paint color, a gorgeous light fixture, a striking piece of artwork, a large mirror, a standout rug, or a unique coffee table. A view outside a large window can also make an excellent focal point. So why are focal points important? They actually can serve multiple practical purposes. First, let's say your focal point is artwork or a large rug. That item could serve as the inspiration for the room's color scheme. If the focal point is your fireplace or a case good item such as a coffee table or a beautiful view, this can help you to determine how to best arrange your furniture, namely around the focal point. If your focal point is a ceiling treatment or a ceiling light fixture, such as a chandelier, it will draw your eye upwards, emphasizing the vertical space. This is an excellent focal point choice for a small room as it will be especially effective in distracting from the smaller size of the room. If your style is minimalist, a striking focal point is absolutely essential to keep your room from feeling plain and uninteresting. Finally, whatever style your room, 
Focal points help you to create a wow moment for your room, which will always elevate the overall interior design. So does every room need to have a focal point? Well, I, and I'm sure the majority of designers would say yes, but sometimes you may have a nicely designed room in which nothing in particular stands out. And while there's nothing wrong with that, if you want to elevate your design, then absolutely incorporate a focal point. So how would you apply this using the 10-step method? Go back to your room design. Let's look at mine as an example. Is there an element in this design that draws your attention? Yes, in my case, it's that back wall with the beautiful bookcases and artwork, which is reinforced by the accent lighting in both the bookcases and on the artwork. But let's say there was nothing in particular that stood out, but rather everything simply works well together. What can we do? I would look to replace one of the items in my room with something more striking. That could be something like artwork, the ceiling light fixture, or coffee table, or I could add in a beautiful wall or ceiling treatment. You can also start a room design with a focal point if you already have an item or element selected, such as a unique piece of furniture or a specific wallpaper. In that case, you would insert the focal point selection somewhere between steps two and three. Your focal point piece will then likely help to inform your selections in the remaining steps, including your style, color scheme, etc. A final important note. In step eight, choose your lighting. Unless your focal point is a light fixture, I would consider using some form of accent lighting to highlight your focal point, if it makes sense to do so, such as a picture light for artwork, directional recess can lights to highlight wall decor, or LED strip lights for a beautiful bookcase. Most people would agree that they love the look and feel of an open floor plan. In the context of the 10-step method you just learned, you may experience challenges around measuring, ideal placement for your furnishings to create zones, and proper lighting techniques. Let's talk first about measuring. Often, the simplest approach to creating room designs within open floor plans is to create separate floor plans for each functional area or zone. So for example, let's say we have a living room, dining room combo area like we see here. You have to decide where the dividing line is between these two spaces so you can create a floor plan for each area, the living room and the dining room. Sometimes you may have natural architectural breaks in the room that can help you to easily find a natural dividing line, such as a door frame, window, pillar, or cabinetry. You can think of the dividing line as an imaginary wall. Once you've done that, then if needed, you can place something on the ground, such as a piece of masking tape, so you can use that as the border for each of your spaces, which will allow you to more easily measure your space. It doesn't matter how many functional zones share an open area. The approach is the same. Find the dividing lines, mark them, measure each area, and draw your floor plan. Now let's discuss how to most effectively use your furnishings to delineate your zones. By far, one of the most effective items is a rug. Not only do rugs feel great underfoot and are an easy way to add color and pattern to a room, but they are also one of the easiest ways to define a space within an open floor plan. You can either choose to use the same rug or choose coordinating rugs, preferably in a coordinating color and style. So how do you choose whether to go with the same rug or coordinating rugs? If your rugs are going to be within two feet or 61 centimeters of each other, I would lean towards using the same rug. If there is at least three feet or 91 centimeters between rugs, then either the same rug or coordinating rugs will work. It's important to ensure that the main furniture pieces are either sitting partially on the rug or completely on the rug within each zone. You can also use furniture to help separate zones within an open floor plan. Specifically, backless benches, console tables, buffets, and open back bookcases are all stylish and effective room dividers. And the last three options have the added benefit of providing extra storage. One often forgotten element for defining open floor plans is the strategic use of colors and or metal finishes. Clearly, when you have an open floor plan, you need to have a cohesive color scheme for the entire space. Ideally, your color scheme will include one to two neutrals and one to three accent colors. However, you can use colors strategically to help define the separate areas, like we see here with the red accents in the dining area. You can also use wallpaper or paint to help delineate an area, 
by papering or painting the focal point wall of that area in a different color. Finally, you can use metal finishes to help define zones. I love mixing metals, and while you might decide to go with the same one or two finishes throughout the entire open floor plan, you could choose to use different finishes to define a space like we see here. In the foreground, we see the living room has used black for the chandelier, the wall decor, and the side table, but they've used a chrome or nickel finish for the two pendants, the table lamp, and the wall mirror. Now let's discuss lighting in the context of open floor plans. First, just like rugs, you can use lighting to help delineate functional zones. In fact, after rugs, light fixtures, in particular chandeliers and pendants, are probably the second best way to help define individual spaces within an open floor plan. Ceiling fans also work. You want to hang your fixture in the middle of the space. Additionally, how high you hang the fixture also matters. More specifically for larger areas, if you hang your fixture at a higher distance, your eye will automatically make the connection that this is a larger space. Contrast the height of this fixture with the chandelier hanging over the dining area. Hanging it lower helps you to quickly determine that this is a smaller space. In terms of how much lighting to use in an open floor plan, well, you want at least one lighting source for every functional area. But depending on the location and function of the zone, I would aim for three to five light sources, if possible. Remember, this includes your accent lighting. It's always better to overlight a space than underlight it. And remember to put as many of your light sources on dimmers as you can so you can control the lighting level and the mood. Two final techniques that you can use to define zones in a room include, first, ensuring each area has its own focal point. As I mentioned in an earlier lecture, common focal points for rooms include, but are not limited to, fireplaces, artwork, ceiling light fixtures, unique ceiling treatments, or a unique furniture piece such as a beautiful coffee table. Second, use formal symmetry. Formal symmetry is one of my favorite techniques, and I particularly love it in an open floor plan because symmetry automatically brings order to a space, which is critical to a well-defined open floor plan. I absolutely love wallpaper. There are so many choices when it comes to wallpaper, regardless of your style and at all price points, so it's definitely an element to consider incorporating as you design your room. To that point, in this lecture, I want to talk about when you should consider using wallpaper, how to best utilize it in a room design, and how to incorporate it into the 10-step process. First, I want to state that I consider wallpaper different and unique from paint. Paint is what I always select last, partly because there are literally thousands of paint color choices, so it's pretty easy to find one that works well with all of the colors in the room. Wallpaper is different, and often it can be the inspiration for a room design, just like a rug or fabric can. So where does wallpaper fit in then? First, let's talk about when you should consider using wallpaper in your design. Wallpaper works in most interior design styles. There are very few styles, if any, that I would completely avoid wallpaper. Even in a style like industrial that is so pared down and neutral in its color palette, there are some excellent faux concrete papers that would look great in this style. Now let's talk about which rooms to use wallpaper in. I especially love using wallpaper in dining rooms, bedrooms, and powder rooms, but they can also look great in nearly any other room of the home. You have to be careful, of course, with using wallpaper in areas with high humidity and bathrooms with tubs and or showers. It's definitely possible to install it in these types of situations, but you need to have the right paper, the right paper hanger, meaning the right installer, and have the proper prep work done. Now let's talk about how to use it in a room design. Wallpaper is commonly used in two ways. It's either used on a focal point wall or it's used in the entire room. For a long time, it seemed as if accent walls were more popular, but I think that has to do more with the size and style of the room. For smaller rooms, like a powder room, hanging the wallpaper on all of the walls is pretty common. For a larger room, you might see wallpaper installed on one wall, just on the ceiling, or on all four walls above a chair rail. You can also use the style of the room to help guide you. Specifically, in more contemporary, modern, and or casual spaces, it's more common to keep the paper to one focal point wall, whereas in more formal and or traditional rooms, papering all four walls would not be uncommon. 
In terms of what type of wallpaper to use, obviously you want it to work with the style of the room and you want to decide if you want it to be a subtle accent to the room or if you want it to be the focal point. These are two very different approaches and you should decide how you want to use the paper before you begin looking at options as there are many, many options available and it's easy to get overwhelmed. For example, if you want something more subtle and you just want to add texture to a room, then I would consider a grass cloth, a faux grass cloth, or a solid colored paper with a subtle pattern. You should also consider the general color or colors you want in your wallpaper, again, to help you narrow down your choices. If you are just using the paper on an accent wall, wallpaper looks best when it coordinates with the paint color. For example, you could go with a dark gray faux grass cloth that will sit next to a mid-tone gray paint on the adjacent wall or walls. Even when going with a bolder wallpaper, I would ensure that at least one of the colors in the paper is comparable to the paint color on the adjacent wall or walls. Now, if you are papering all four walls, then you only have to worry about coordinating the colors in the wallpaper with the other furnishings in your room. Now let's talk about how you incorporate the selection of wallpaper within the 10-step process. The answer to this depends on what type of wallpaper you envision for the space. If it's going to be a more subtle paper, then I'll usually select it after I've selected the furniture. However, if I plan on having the wallpaper be a more prominent design element with a strong pattern and color in the room, then I will likely select it after I've selected my style as the wallpaper will help to determine or dictate this color scheme for the room. For some great choices in wallpaper, again, for many different styles and at all price points, I would recommend checking out burkdecor.com, wallpaperdirect.com, and brewsterwallcovering.com. Where I live, this is a common problem in basements, but obviously occurs with other interior rooms in a home. There are some great strategies that one can use to really brighten up this type of space and even fooling the eye into thinking that there are windows. So let's get to it. First, I would definitely use a light paint color, particularly warm white or cream, but also light beige or gray would work. Just make sure that paint being used is not in a flat finish, and I would absolutely use at least one large mirror somewhere in the room to help reflect light and provide the illusion of a window. I would be sure to incorporate a strong layered lighting scheme, meaning light fixtures to provide ambient lighting, task lighting, and accent lighting in the room as well as to further brighten the space and make sure that all of your lighting needs will be met. I would also incorporate a large piece of artwork to serve three functions. First, it will help break up the wall space, which is what windows typically do. Second, it will help to distract from the fact that there aren't any windows. And third, it may be able to be used as your room's focal point. One other technique I've used is to hang floor to ceiling drapes on a wall where a pair of windows might naturally be. This has two advantages. It provides the impression that there are windows behind the drapes and it softens the space visually. Finally, I would include some higher quality silk plants to the space to help liven up and soften the space at the same time. When I'm working with clients who need their home to be child and or pet friendly, there are some go-to materials that I will frequently specify. For flooring, tile or vinyl are usually my top choices. Even if you wanted wood flooring, there are many porcelain tiles on the market now that look so much like wood without the upkeep, and luxury vinyl plank or LVP, which is designed to look like wood or stone, is becoming an increasingly popular choice in homes with pets and children. For fabrics and rugs, the selection of indoor-outdoor choices is excellent. Not only do they work well, but they look great. Sunbrella fabric is a particularly good choice for seating. Otherwise, I would be sure to apply fabric protection to all of my seating. There are many competitors to the original Scotchgard that are excellent and companies that will be happy to apply them for you. Slipcover furniture and washable curtains are also a smart choice so that these covers can be easily washed as needed. Along the same lines, one trick I'll use is to purchase fabrics such as curtains, sofas, rugs, etc. 
that are similar in color to the pet's fur so that when they do shed, the hair on the fabric is not so obvious. Going back to rugs, if you prefer the feel of something softer underfoot, I would look at dark patterned polypropylene rugs, which are generally great at hiding stains, and because they aren't terribly expensive, it's something you can change out every year or two if needed. As far as accessories, I would look to incorporate non-breakable, lightweight materials such as wood and plastic. If the pets are inclined to eat plants, I would incorporate higher-end silk plants instead and either go with taller indoor silk trees or place smaller, real plants on higher surfaces out of the reach of small children and pets. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the importance of providing a scratching post for any cats and regularly trimming buffing a dog's nails as well to cut down on damage to the soft fabrics in the home. For those pets who are not easily deterred, there are enzyme sprays that can be purchased or homemade and sprayed on fabrics that are meant to deter pets from scratching and biting your home furnishings. I really believe that you don't have to sacrifice style with small children or pets. You just need to think a little differently. If you live in an area that is hot and humid year round, you may either know or suspect that certain materials and color schemes are preferable, and you would be correct. First and foremost, I highly recommend using a light color scheme and include colors like white, beige, grayish, light gray, and other cool colors, such as blue, green, and lavender for the main colors in your room. So why do I say that? In a study by a company with a website called Color Matters, they found that test subjects who entered a room with a cool color palette stated that the temperature of the room was 6 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the room's base temperature, and those who entered a room with a warmer color palette conversely stated that the temperature of the room was 6 to 10 degrees warmer than the room actually was. That is pretty phenomenal and worth considering as you make your color palette choices. Okay, but what if you love warm colors? Does this mean you can't use them? No, of course you can. I would personally stick to using them in the accessories of the room, such as your artwork, wall decor, throw pillows, floor pillows, poofs, throw blankets, and possibly your rug. Also, I would use fabrics that don't absorb much heat, like cotton, linen, and polyester, and avoid fabrics like leather, vinyl, and wool. Other materials that generally work well in humid climates include steel, stone, and glass. So these can be great choices for furniture pieces and tabletops. Having good window treatments are important for keeping the hot sun out. I like to combine a shade specifically meant to keep heat out, such as solar shades, insulated cellular shades, faux wood blinds, as real wood can warp in humidity, and appropriately lined Roman shades with linen or cotton curtains. In the cooler evenings, the shades can be opened and the lightweight curtains can be drawn to allow the cool breeze to come in through an open window while maintaining privacy. In addition to using ceiling fans, installing window film to block sunlight and heat can also help drive down that air conditioning bill. For flooring, stone or tile is a great choice for hot, humid climates. Additionally, I would choose synthetic rugs, such as polypropylene, as these can usually stand up to more humid climates. Sadly, wool rugs are not a great choice because they can absorb quite a bit of water. And while jute, another favorite of mine, is great for hot climates, it doesn't work well for humid climates as it can attract mold and mildew. Finally, I recommend investing in a portable or whole house dehumidifier, which can help greatly with reducing the humidity level in your home. Great job, and that's it. You now know how to design pretty much any room in 10 easy steps. As a quick review, here are the steps again. Step one, measure your room. Step two, decide on the key activities. Step three, choose your style. Step four, choose your color scheme. Step five, choose your rug. Step six, choose your furniture. Step seven, choose your wall art and wall decor. Step eight, choose your lighting. Step nine, choose your window coverings. And step 10, 
choose your accessories and your greenery. Hopefully you are now feeling confident to tackle your own design project and create a beautiful and practical space in your own home. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send me an email. I am more than happy to help answer your follow-up questions. Thank you so much and happy decorating. In many parts of the world, it's not uncommon to have a radiator directly beneath a window, which can create a bit of a design challenge when it comes to window treatments. So let's talk about some viable solutions. If the radiator is directly below your window and does not extend past the window edges, then one great option is to hang stationary curtain or drapery panels that don't move on the sides of the window to frame your window, and then layer that with a simple window covering like a roller shade Roman shade, woven shade, or stylish blinds for privacy. Alternatively, you could forgo the curtains or drapes altogether and just use a roller shade, Roman shade, etc. for that window. If your radiator does extend beyond the edge of the window, then your best solution is to hang inside or outside mount shades or blinds over these windows. If you have other windows in the room that don't have an obstruction, then I would hang the same shades or blinds on the other windows but consider pairing them with curtains or drapes that coordinate with the shades to add texture and softness to your room. First, let's just clarify that this is a single large room, for example, a large living room, and not an open floor plan situation. The best way to make a large room feel smaller and cozier is primarily through strategic color and lighting selections. Let's first talk color. Darker colors in general make a room feel cozier and in a big room more manageable. In particular, your walls, whether that's your paint, wallpaper, or some other wall treatment. Darker paint or wall treatments will help the walls to feel as if they are advancing and a smaller room feels cozier. This is also true if you have a high ceiling. In general, painting your ceiling a dark color or even a few shades darker than your walls will help to visually lower the ceiling. Going back to your walls, you can either use the same darker paint color on all four walls or you can absolutely choose to have an accent wall. Accent walls will break up your space visually and help it to feel a bit smaller and cozier. Additionally, choosing a dark primary hue such as navy blue, charcoal gray, deep red, or dark green as your primary color in your color scheme is always a good choice in this type of situation. However, to avoid a cave-like feeling, be sure to use mirrors, glass, or polished metal case good items, a variety of textures, light flooring, or light or bright rugs, as well as some lighter or brighter furniture pieces. Additionally, using chair rail or wainscoting in the room, and in the case of chair rail, using two different colors or treatments above and below the rail will also help to break up the vastness of the room and help your room to feel a bit cozier. But if you're not a fan of wainscoting or chair rail, then as an alternative, I would recommend painting your base and crown molding a different color from your walls. Along the same lines, I would be sure to use window treatments that contrast with the wall. Contrast on walls, whether that's through wall treatments or window treatments, help a room to feel a bit smaller and as a result, cozier as well. The design cousin to color is patterns and using a variety of patterns in a room will create a number of visual breaks and help the room to feel smaller and cozier. Same with texture. Be sure to use a variety of different textures in a large room for maximizing that cozy feeling. Now let's talk lighting. If I were trying to make a large room feel cozier, I would use a number of table lamps and floor lamps with opaque shades positioned away from the walls throughout the room, and I would pair these with a low light chandelier or a chandelier on a dimmer placed in the center of the room. Apart from color and lighting, be sure that you are using furniture that is appropriately scaled for the room, of course, meaning large or even oversized pieces. For example, in a large bedroom, I would be sure to use a large or even oversized headboard, which helps to fill up some of the empty wall space. 
Additionally, be sure that you have the typical distances between your furniture items as you would in a regular sized room, such as 14 to 18 inches or 36 to 46 centimeters between your sofa and coffee table, and no more than 10 feet or 3 meters between individuals in a seating arrangement. If you can't find a coffee table large enough for your space, consider using two identical coffee tables instead. Finally, be sure that there aren't any empty corners or large empty areas in your room, which just emphasizes the large space. Instead, consider large floor plants, console tables, or create an extra seating area in these empty spaces. Irregular shaped rooms can include many different design challenges, including walls that are too long or too short, columns or other architectural features that break up the room, and small nooks that seem unusable. Of course, each room is unique, but there are some general strategies that will work in most irregular shaped rooms. First, I would use a light color on the walls, ceiling, and all architectural features in the room. This will help soften all of the lines and make the room feel more balanced and cohesive. Second, it's important to create separate zones in the room, which will make furniture placement much easier, as you can measure and think about each zone separately, just like I spoke about in the lecture on open floor plans. For example, if you have a small nook or area, this may be the perfect place for a small writing desk and chair, or it could be turned into a small reading nook. Not having to consider how this area fits into the bigger space frees up your mind to consider how the area can best be utilized based on its unique shape and size. This approach also goes perfectly with step two, decide on key activities. Once you've decided on your key activities, you can then decide which zones will be used for each activity. Now, if you have separate zones, it's important that you still use a single color scheme in the room and repeat colors patterns and elements throughout the space so that the room's design still feels cohesive. Another excellent approach is to have custom furniture, such as bookshelves, built specifically for that space. Anytime you have the ability to add extra storage is nearly always a plus for any home. Now, if you have an awkwardly placed window, install floor-to-ceiling drapes along the length of the entire wall, which will give the impression of symmetrical windows and provide balance to your room. Finally, having a great focal point is especially important in an irregular shaped room because just like with a small room, a focal point will also help distract from the shape of the room.